Hi guys and welcome to another video and in this video I've got seven things that you might want to be careful of when you're getting into the security dog industry or if you are in the security dog industry. These are just seven of my preferred ones. There probably are a lot more. I'm hoping some people will put some down in the comments, some of the ones that I've missed. But yeah, let's jump straight into the seven things that I think you need to be careful of whether you're getting into the industry or whether you are in the security dog industry. And the first one, the first one is to be careful on spend. Now, this is probably more when you're getting into the security dog industry, because when you're getting into the security dog industry, in my experience, I would say that getting into the security dog industry is where most of your spend comes from. That's from buying a vehicle, buying the cages, buying the stuff that you're going to need in order to work in the security dog industry. So I think you just need to be careful on spend. No one is expecting you to have absolutely everything when you first get into the security dog industry just concentrate on the stuff that you need to have in order to work so obviously that's going to be a vehicle that's going to be a cage that's going to be uh stuff on the um like fire extinguishers stuff that you have to have in order to be in the security dog industry key uh, leads collars them sorts of stuff don't concentrate too much on on other stuff that are sort of extras etc do that on a monthly basis tick stuff off on a monthly basis so when you get your wage packet you just go right with this wage packet i'm going to buy myself a torch with this wage packet i'm going to buy, buy myself a really good pair of boots you'll probably get you probably want to get yourself a cheap pair of boots to start off with if you can't afford it at the time but then like, like i say first one i'm going to get myself a really good torch second one i'm going to get myself a really good pair of boots third one i'm going to get myself a really good jacket like don't throw loads of money into it because Again, speaking to other people and different things and other and different things like that, making sure that the security dog industry is for you before you go and spend a lot of money. Now, I obviously have got my how much video that sort of puts out how much you can expect to spend. And it's quite a lumpy sum. And if after six months you decide that it's not really for you, that's a lot of money to put out. So I think when you're getting into the security dog industry, just spend the money on the stuff that you need and then on a monthly basis work out what you can afford to put aside to a better torch better boots better jacket them sorts of stuff but yeah concentrate your, your spend getting into the industry on things like vehicle crates collars leads them sorts of stuff that you have to have in order to do the work my second one my second one is not getting involved in stuff that you don't need to i see a lot of people on facebook groups on all different sorts of platforms getting themselves getting themselves involved in stuff that they just don't need to and i think that arguing with uh, pet owners or arguing with with dog owners that aren't in our field etc i'm not saying that they're going to be any worse handlers i'm not saying they're going to be any worse owners of dogs than we are but sometimes it's like banging your head against a brick wall and sometimes your experience and your training etc they don't want to hear about it they only want to hear their own voice so i think definitely just don't get yourself involved in stuff that you don't need to get involved with um like i say I, I think it's one of the things that i see quite a lot um even in security dog handling groups etc where people start arguing and i think security dog handling it can be a little bit clicky and if you go up against the wrong person that's got lots of mates it can not they don't gang up but it can it can become a lot one-sided so my advice is just don't get involved in stuff that you don't need to speak just keep your conversations between the people that you like to hang around with etc but yeah one of my big things in security dog handling is just don't get involved in stuff that you don't need to my third one and it's something that i do i've noticed that i've done i've been pulled up on by the fiance for doing and that is talking to people as if i'm talking to a dog and I, i'm not talking about being smudgy smudgy not being authoritarian but definitely giving people commands i spend so much time with the dogs lots of time on my own where it's just me and the dog that i got into a, a kind of way in which i obviously speak to the dog through commands and different things like that that i found that's leaked into my personal life should we say that where if i'm if i'm doing something with the missus etc i'll give her a release command i'll go okay then 
and that's the same thing that I use for the dogs. If I've got the dogs at a heel position and then I want to give them some freedom, I'll say to the dogs, okay, off you go. And I found that that has kind of diluted into kind of my personal life where I will not give the not give the fiance commands, but I will use the same kind of words. So I'll give her a release command of, okay, go on then. And she says to me, don't talk to me like you're talking to the dog. And look, it's not a big thing. It's not as if I'm commanding and I'm telling her to do certain stuff. But I have found that in my personal life, because I spend so much time on my own, because it's just me and the dog and I spend a lot of time training the dog, that I've kind of found that some of my work language or work communication has leaked into uh, sort of my personal life. So just keep in mind that obviously when you're working with the dogs, you're working with the dogs, but don't lose being able to talk to people in a normal manner without giving them a command. So don't give your fiance a release command to tell her she can go and do something because she will start pulling you up on it because she'll notice that you start talking to them the same way that you do the dogs sometimes. You might not mean, you don't mean it. You might not mean it. You don't mean it. It's just the language that you've been using for five, six, seven nights in a row. And then all of a sudden you're talking to a person and all of a sudden you just start using the same language. So it's not a big thing. I don't ever mean to do it, but I have noticed that I've started doing it. I've been pulled up on it a couple of times as well. My next one, my next one is getting taken advantage of. And this can go two kinds of ways. So let's talk about it in a work capacity first. I've seen people get taken advantage of and the, the, the people that I've normally seen that happen to are new handlers because companies will look at new handlers and go, right, they're keen, they, they haven't got as much experience, they don't know the industry the right way. And I've seen people get taken advantage of. I've seen someone that lived, lived in Essex get given a 12-hour uh, shift in Bristol for like two or three nights. And they to sweeten the deal, they said, right, we'll give you a vehicle, you pay for your petrol, we want you to go to Bristol and do these shifts. Now, the vehicle that they, they gave him wasn't like a welfare. It's, it wasn't one that he would be able to stay over in. And they knew that he didn't want to do any overnight stays, but they still gave him two or three um, shifts in Bristol from Essex, which involved him traveling six hours a day, working 12 hour shifts, and then obviously only being at home for six hours to get some sleep before he goes back again. And the reason that he done the reason that they would have given him that site is because all of their other handlers would have told them where to go if they got offered that. But because he was new to the industry, because he obviously was excited to get started and different things like that, he ended up doing it. And when I spoke to him, I said, look, you cannot be doing that. Like, you're you're not only are you traveling for six hours a day, you're paying for that petrol. They're not even paying for you to go all the way to Bristol. Okay, they're pay they've they've obviously given you the car, but when you start looking at it, like He's traveling six hours, so he's basically working. I, I know it's not, but he's basically working for six hours for nothing. He's paying the petrol. I mean, I don't know what the mileage is from, from Essex to Bristol, but I would hazard a guess that he's probably doing a conservative guess, 60 to 70 quids of worth of fuel a day. If you're only getting, let's say, um, let's say you're getting 130 quid, if you start taking 70 quid off of that a day and you're working six hours for nothing, you're basically working for free. And I've seen another example of that. It was someone that was working in sort of the East Kent region that was getting sent right into the middle of central London to go and work at Hyde Park on a seasonal event. And I said to him, why are you being sent in there? And again, they said, look, we'll give you a vehicle to go and do that travel. You just need to pay the petrol. But yeah, but that's fine again making making someone that's new to the industry drive to somewhere no one else wants to go all the other handlers would have turned around and said absolutely not i'm not doing that so not only are they getting him to do it they're they're making him pay the petrol etc and i think it's just it's just one of them things that when you're new and you're excited to get started sometimes that can be used against you that they will they will say, look, this is what this is what we want you to do, and they won't offer you an alternative. Now, I was lucky when it, when I got in, because when I think about it, when I first got into the industry, I possibly would have maybe gone and done the Hyde Park, or I might have driven a, a longish distance to go and start my dog handling journey, doing my first few shifts, etc. 
but my boss was good enough to go right here's a local one get started on here with such and such and then we'll work it out after that and after that i've never really been given a site that's a long long way away um so i think sometimes that your eagerness to get going your naivety into the security dog industry can sometimes be used against you where you can have that used against you where they will take advantage because let me tell you if you're if you're in Essex and you're being sent to Bristol for free 12-hour shifts the reason that they're sending you is because no other handler is going to accept that every other handler is going to tell them where to swivel and if they've taken on that job and can't cover it that is not your issue it's the company's issues to sort that out it's not your issue that they can't cover a site that is i don't know what's essex to bristol 200 miles away it's not your issue so just be careful that you don't get taken advantage of and they don't use your naivety and your eagerness to get going against you my next one my next one is not letting people talk down your job now as a lot of you, have, if you've been following me for a while, etc., I've spoken quite honestly about this job. And a lot I've said that if you're getting into this industry thinking that you're going to be chasing criminals, it's going to be fighting crime and it's going to be full of action, that is that is not correct. But I would never let someone talk down my job. Now, yes, we get lots of time where it is spending lots of time in the van, chilling out, training with the dog, etc., and different things like that. But I would never let someone talk down my job in terms of... When I look at it, I look at it as sort of like a like a firefighter, and I don't want to talk down firefighting. But obviously, firefighters are on duty for periods of time, but they can only use their skills when they're required. So, for example, they may do a, a twelve-hour shift, but they might only get called out once or twice, and that's when they use their skills. I see this very similar where. I sit here with with my skills, but my skills are only useful when they're called upon. I can't make up scenarios to in order to use my skills, etc. So I'd never let someone talk down my job because I'm still doing it here. I'm still available and my skills are still available to do this job. Whether they're called upon isn't really my call. It's obviously up to other people to make my skills needed for that to happen. So don't let people talk down your job. Don't let people say that oh, all you do is go to site and you fall asleep or that all you do is go to site and sit there and do nothing. We are still working. Yes, we, a lot of the time it is just looking out, watching, patrolling, etc. But them same people, when your skills are required, they will be looking to you as someone with them skills in order to deal, that, deal with that situation. That situation might only happen once a week, once a month, once every six months, once a year. But just because your your skills are only required at them times, it doesn't mean that you're any less skilled in the time that you have that the time that you have off. My next one is taking advice that doesn't sound right. And I think that this is something that I've kind of learnt and speaking to different people, I've kind of learnt what to accept and and what I think is nonsense. And a lot of the time that you will get handlers that will maybe hype up a situation uh, that will make it sound a little bit more dangerous or they might set, make it sound like they've done a little bit more than possibly they did. Now, obviously not being there, I don't know exactly, but there's definitely lots of times that I've taken or been given advice where I thought, you know what, that doesn't sound right to me. And I've asked another handler and they've said, no, that doesn't sound right to me either. And just because you're just because someone is more senior than you just because someone's been doing this job longer than you it doesn't always mean that their advice is always correct and i think that if you if you hear something that doesn't sound right or you doesn't you don't think sits in within what you've heard in terms of like the dangerous dogs act uh, the, the guard dogs act etc always just go and ask someone else just ask another handler and just give maybe don't give them what they've said just give them the scenario and see what they say and then maybe ask someone else and i think it's good to get a couple of different bits of advice on the same situation um because in there there will probably be a common thing that you can pick out and say right all three of them have said this this one hyped it up a little bit but these other two have said the same sort of thing 
So, and then you can make your mind up to where it kind of sits. But yeah, I've had lots of advice given to me that didn't sound right. And I've asked someone like Terry or I've asked someone at training said, someone said this to me the other day, what do you think? And then they'll give their opinion on it. So just because someone's been in the, been in the industry longer than you doesn't mean they're always correct. And that goes for me as well. Like I'm never going to say that everything I say is always a hundred percent correct. And whatever I say is the absolute, um, is the absolute bible of what you should live by because there'll be people watching watching my stuff that'll say look he doesn't know what he's talking about etc so just because someone talks about stuff that that makes it sound like they they know what they're doing sometimes they don't look i might be i might be guilty of that a little bit i definitely think that going back through videos not that i've said stuff that's incorrect but maybe I've worded it the wrong way and so, so that someone could have taken it the wrong way, etc. So yeah, just if you get some advice that doesn't sound right to you, go and ask someone else, maybe ask a couple of people, see what everyone else says and then make up your own mind from there. And my last one, my last one is giving dog training advice to pet owners. Now this, I think... This is one of the things that you will possibly learn and it's something that I've kind of noticed as well is that people will come to you as someone with a NASDU or someone that works with dogs, who trains with dogs, etc. They will come to you and say, look, I've got this issue and I don't know how to sort it out. You will probably have an idea of how to sort it out. You will possibly be able to help them in order to sort it out there and then. But if there's one thing I've learned with pet owners is that they will accept a lower level of um, a lower level of quality in their dog, etc. They will bend the rules for their dogs a little bit more. If you go through Instagram, you will see lots of dogs being spoiled, lots of dogs doing things that maybe we wouldn't accept. And the reason for that is is that pet owners will be very good at doing something for a day maybe doing it for a week and then they'll just stop and they'll say well he got better for a bit and then it come back and we couldn't be bothered to do the training again and the problem is with that is that it looks bad on you that you couldn't help solve that issue when although you had the the answer to their issue because they wasn't committed enough because they only done it for a day because they only done it with the time that you was there it looks bad on you that you can end up sorting it out. So I've always said to people, people have always come to me and said, look, I've got this issue with a dog. I've, I've just got a new dog. What do you think? I always give them videos in order to help. Um, so when they get new new puppies, etc., about I give I send them YouTube videos that tells them how to bring them up with sort of environmental training, maybe something to do with luring, different things like that from people that are much more qualified than I am in order to, to give that advice. But when people come to me and say look my dog has this has this issue that's fine i might be able to help you with that for the 20 minutes that i'm there doing it with you but are you going to do that past there i think pet 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 training is one of the biggest not the biggest cons but it's one of the biggest money spinners because definitely what i found so before i'd done this i used to go to a german shepherd club and basically there was a good between eight and 12 German shepherds that turn up to this this group once a week. And basically all it was, you go there, you'd socialize with other German shepherd owners. The dogs would kind of socialize together. Some dogs were more sociable than others, but you would go there and you would do, you would teach the dog to sit down, all them sorts of stuff. And I would go to, I would go to this session and they say, right, we're gonna put the dog in a down. You're gonna let your dog let go of the lead you're going to walk around the room and then come back to the dog and okay the first time i do it put coop down goes to walk away he gets up put him in the down he gets up but by the time we got by the time we've done that the next week i could put the lead down walk around the room and come back and he'll be fine but what i found with all the other dog owners is that even doing it two three two three weeks in a row no one was able to put their lead down and walk off without their dog getting up because they wasn't practicing at home lots of people were just using it for kind of like a social thing and although they was trying to teach their teach the owners to teach their dog tricks or to teach their dogs to do different things they was okay doing it for the time that they was there but as soon as they got home they just they just didn't care so i think we in terms of giving giving pet owners advice look you can help them but say to them look this is only going to work if you do it whilst i'm not here don't just do it just to entertain me 
do it whilst you're, whilst you're not there. But like I say, I think giving out pet advice isn't, it, it, I don't think it works out well for you more times than it does work out well for you. So they are my seven things to be careful of. I think there's a bit of a mixture in there between stuff to look out for when you first get into it, stuff to look out for when you are in the security dog industry, etc. Look, they're just sort of seven things that I've kind of thought of. Down in the comment section below, just put down some of the things that you think people might need to be careful of, whether that's whether getting into the industry or whether when you're in the industry, still things to be careful of because there's always someone that's going to try and pinch a little inch off of you, etc. So if you like this video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. Subscribe down below for loads more videos. And as for now, I'll see you again next week. Oh, down in the description is also my Patreon. If you like what I do and want to help support what I do, uh, the link for the, my Patreon is down below. For £3 a month, you can really help me out to continue doing this, etc. And I'll see you again next week. Cheers for watching. See you later. Bye.